Hello everyone. Today we are going to start talking about system structure. This is one of my favorite topics in the class, so hopefully we can have a good talk about it. What is system structure? System structure is simply answering the question, how are different pieces of software structured in the system? Um, how are they isolated from each other? And how do they communicate? This is the core of what system structure is. So in a monolithic system, um, as a so-called monolithic system, such as Linux, you have a kernel. That kernel essentially has access to all of the resources on the system and must be absolutely trusted. We run applications in processes above that, and that defines a system structure of the system. Each of those processes are executed in user mode and somehow isolated from each other. So all of them are isolated from each other, and the kernel is isolated from them and they communicate with the system effectively by system calls, asking the kernel for different features using the hardware features of dual mode protection. So this is an example of system structure. I'll revisit it. Um, a lot, another way to think about this is effectively, how does the system use dual mode protection to break up the software in the system? And also, how does it use virtual address spaces? This is a new concept that is going to remain a little um, opaque, this class. We'll dive into a little bit more next and then a lot more in classes to follow. Virtual address spaces is just the idea of all of the memory that one of your applications, one of your processes has access to. The idea is that you want every single application to think that it has access to its own memory and that that memory is effectively all of the memory on the system. Maybe it can ask for more memory, but it owns all of it and can uh, formulate addresses to all of it. This is why we call it a virtual address space. Effectively, it's virtual, which means, of course, that it's fake. Um, and it's an address space. It's simply all of the memory that we can address, uh, for instance, with pointers. Now, system structure is really important, and we're talking about it today because it has a huge impact on the security and reliability of systems and can also in some ways impact how you program for them and how maintainable they are. So let's start with a trivial system. Um, MS-DOS or FreeRTOS, a lot of kind of small embedded real-time operating systems nowadays that control the physical world, um, they effectively have no structure whatsoever, which is to say you have your application, um, the version of an operating system, which for DOS was a resident system program, you have device drivers, and then you have actual um, firmware and hardware effectively. So what's shown here, all of that was in the kernel. There was no user level computation, therefore there's no isolation in the system, therefore it's effectively no structure whatsoever. The plus side of this style of organization is effectively that it's function calls all around. If you want to communicate between different aspects or different parts of the software, you just make simple function calls. So it's very, very fast, as fast as our normal execution. The downside, of course, is that you have no isolation whatsoever. If there's some sort of a fault that happens in one portion of the software, that fault will percolate till the rest of the system trivially, right? So a fault within your program can cause my program to crash very easily, right? Now, revisiting that notion of a monolithic operating system, this is effectively Unix, Windows, OS X. Please go to Piazza and post to me how I'm wrong about um, OS X. There's a little bit more nuance that I'm going to convey here. Uh, for that, uh, uh, by that same logic, do the same about Windows and even modern Linux. Um, but how I want you to think about monolithic operating systems is effectively that you have user mode and kernel mode provided by dual mode hardware, as we've talked about. You have the hardware on the very bottom that's managed by the operating system that runs in kernel mode, right? So this is fairly natural given everything that we've been talking about so far in the class. And then above that, in user mode, we have separate virtual address spaces organized into your applications, Word, Excel, your browser, etc. Those are all different address spaces executing at user level. And we know that if they want to communicate with the rest of the system, they make a system call, right? So we talked about how a system call works and the mechanics behind it still is a little opaque. Um, 
but we kind of get the gist of what a system call is. It's relatively fast. It involves switching between different modes, user mode to kernel mode, switching stacks and saving and restoring registers. That's about it, right? It's nowhere near on the order of a function call. Um, it's much more expensive than that, often maybe one to two orders of magnitude faster. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, relatively fast. So in this type of a scheme, a monolithic system, all of the operating system services, file system, networking, memory management, scheduling, network device drivers, etc., all of the um, DMA ring buffers, all of that, those are all in the kernel, right? Now, the downside of this is that when something is in the kernel, we know that it has access to all of the resources on the system. So it must be trusted and must work properly, right? And this is challenging because, and this is a very old graph, I sincerely apologize, but it'll give you an idea. Um, here you see Windows 95, 98, XP up to Windows Vista, so this is pretty old. Uh, well, very old, I should say. But you see the source code progression through all of those, right? You start out with Windows 95, that was about 50 million lines of code, and by Vista, it's up to 50 million lines of code, and that just kept on increasing, right? And this is not just a Windows thing. Linux has the same type of a, a growth. OS X, I'm sure, has the same. So all of this is lines of code effectively in the kernel. And you know how hard it is to get your programs that are, you know, hundreds to thousands of lines executing. Take that up to 50 million and ask yourself, you know, what is the probability that they've gotten rid of all of the bugs? What is the probability that there's no vulnerability in there that can be exploited by a hacker to be able to take over the system, right? To execute some code that you don't want to be executing in kernel mode, right? So the general problem with monolithic system structures is effectively that you have to trust the kernel, and the kernel is so large that it's effectively untrustworthy to the extreme, right? So there's a little bit of a contradiction there. But on the other hand, you know, they're pretty reliable. For us, using them for desktops, when you don't necessarily have malicious at uh, intents attacking them, you know, they're pretty reliable, they work pretty well. Um, generally pretty easy to use. So the monolithic system structure, I think it's uh, very good for things like desktops where you don't necessarily need to put all of your trust in the system for it to execute correctly. Um, <clears throat> another very positive aspect of the monolithic system structure, and I just want to be very explicit with this, is that it's very fast. The only structure is to essentially isolate applications, which obviously kind of need to be isolated from each other and the kernel needs to be isolated from them. So it's effectively the minimum amount of isolation that you could possibly get by with to be able to isolate applications from each other. And they're very fast because you effectively have system calls as your main kind of overhead of that structure. And that's about it. So, um, Another system structure is microkernels. Micro denotes small, right? So you can kind of tell by the name that this is effectively saying a small kernel in some way, right? So you see in the top, you see that we have kernel level code, of course, you have user level code, many different virtual address spaces running our applications and other things. And you can see that the kernel in and of itself, the goal is effectively to have it under 10,000 lines of code. Uh, lines of code, sorry. So K lock is thousand lines of code, right? Um, so now your kernel is fairly restricted to less than 10,000 lines of code. It's much more likely that you can get it correct. And there are actually systems out there that have formally and mathematically verified that all their code is correct in the kernel, which is very impressive. Um, but if you don't have all of the code for things like networking file systems and memory management device drivers in the kernel, where does it go, right? It's not like that code can like go away. If it could just go away, you wouldn't have it in monolithic systems either, right? So 
In, mono, in microkernel based systems, you move that code to separate virtual address spaces that don't ap execute applications, but instead execute your actual system services, which is what you see in the diagram here. So if you have an application that wants to now read something from the file system, instead of just making a call to the kernel and getting a response, it needs to use IPC, inner process communication, to be able to communicate with the file system virtual address space process. Um, you can think of process and virtual address space as being synonymous here. Um, it tries to communicate with the file system, pass some arguments to, for instance, an open call to open some sort of a file, and then the file system will return um, data back to the application. In this case, that it opened the file for it and that um, it can access the file through some sort of file descriptor, for instance. So it does what open would do. But instead of the open being a system call within the kernel, it is now a call that it gets made between different processes. So the application can ask the file system. So this is the general gist and idea behind a microkernel. And of course, the file system itself might require more memory at some point in time. So it would invoke through IPC the memory management um, component or service, and the memory management service would provide it more memory, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, right? So the general idea is to break apart the kernel into multiple user level components that can be isolated from each other, and then use IPC to communicate between them, right? Okay, so that's the general idea behind a microkernel. What's kind of the cost benefit analysis, right? So it moves the functionality from the kernel to the user space. Um, it uses IPC to communicate between these servers. And uh, servers is a bad word here, but it's the common one. Uh, server is just a, one of those services, like the file system service running at user level. Now, if you think about it, what we've done is broken apart the software into a whole bunch of different pieces, right? Because we've done that, that means that if the file system wants to call malloc, for instance, that might be provided by a memory management service. We could actually replace that memory management service with a different version that implements malloc in a different way. So it's really easy to swap out functionality here, and it's really easy to add functionality to the system, because all that it is is starting up another process, right? The general idea behind microkernels is, of course, that they're vastly more reliable. Um, and the idea behind this is that they're more reliable partially because there's just less code running in kernel level. So there's a lower probability that you're actually going to trigger a bug in the kernel or a hacker is going to be able to exploit a bug in the kernel. It's easier to vet 10,000 lines of code than 50 million lines of code is the, the intuition there. Um, there have been long studies done that you kind of have um, one to three, I think, if I remember correctly, bugs every hundred lines of code um, in pretty much any code base. And that means that, you know, if you're writing in C and you need to write a lot more code to get something done, you're probably going to have more bugs relative to if you write it in Python and you just need fewer lines to do that, right? Um, but the number of bugs per line of code tends to be pretty invariant. So what do you do? You try to minimize the number, the amount of code, minimize the size of the kernel, right? Um, okay. Additionally, because you've split up the operating system functionalities into these different processes, it means that they're afforded kind of the, the same conveniences that our normal applications are afforded, which means that if one of them fails, perhaps we can just reboot it and start their system running again. That gets a little complicated because if the memory management service fails, well, like, what does that mean about all the memory it was providing to all the other services, right? So it gets more complicated. It's not that simple. Um, but certainly two unrelated services that don't invoke each other are going to get a lot of benefit from this, right? But I want you to think for a second about what the downside of this is, right? Okay, um, hopefully you've thought about that a little bit. The main downside to this is that notice all of these arrows they aren't just system calls. They aren't just going from an application down to the kernel and that's it, kind of returning later with the, the answer to the system call. They're actually making a system call to go down to the kernel 
and then returning up to user level to invoke, for instance, the file system, right? The file system service. And then for the file system service to return its data, to act like a function call and return its data to the application, it needs to essentially make what looks like another um, system call. It needs to call down to the kernel and the kernel needs to return, not to the file system, but to the application, right? So what used to be one system call actually becomes two system calls. And additionally, we'll find out much later in the class, about halfway through the class, that actually switching between these virtual address spaces is pretty expensive. Um, on the grand, like I'll give you a few numbers to give you an intuition about all these costs. A function call takes between like two and 10 cycles. Um, a system call takes round about 100 cycles, um, between 30 and 100, but I'll just say 100 for simplicity. Um, switching between virtual address spaces takes about 300. So you have something that takes like two to 10 cycles, and then it's an order of magnitude 100 cycles slower to do a system call, and then it's three times slower to actually switch between the virtual address spaces, right? So for IPC, we have two system calls, that's 200 cycles, and we need to switch between virtual address spaces twice, that's 600 cycles. So by that very naive metric, you might think that it's about 800 cycles just to do an IPC. Indeed, systems, including a research system, Pioneer at um, GW really take that number even lower than that, um, mainly because I'm hand-waving about some of those overheads. But long story short, that's much more expensive than a function call, and it's more expensive than just a system call, right? So you have some downsides for uh, microkernels because of this. <clears throat> There's a non-intuitive benefit as well in that it kind of forces you to modularize your code, right? Because now your code is split up into these different pieces. So it makes you very explicit about dependencies between them, which has software engineering benefits. Microkernels are mainly useful in systems that really must be trusted. So in embedded systems, um, you that's where you'll often find microkernels. Um, in military systems, you often find microkernels. And this is just because security and reliability are such at such a premium in those systems that you really need to ensure it in every way, shape, and form. And the system structure provided by microkernels focuses on that and has some overhead with respect to performance. Okay, the third system that we're going to look at, I don't count no structure because um, nobody really uses that much anymore except for small little systems, um, is virtual machines. So I'd like you to think just a little bit, kind of uh, pause the video and recall a little bit what you think virtual machines are. You've already set them up for the system, but that's kind of executing some commands, right? What do you actually think virtual machines are? Think about it for a second, then unpause me. Um, Penny is pondering here. She's on horrible laundry and yet still pondering what VMs are and what function they serve in the world. Good girl. Um, okay, so there's some terminology with respect to virtual machines that we're going to need to get back. It gets a little confusing. Um, so with virtual machine, we're trying to run a operating system, but effectively in kind of user level. Right? We're trying to run a whole operating system, including a kernel, but not in the actual kernel of the real machine. This means that we need to define some stuff. So the host is the actual kernel on the system. So we say the virtual machine host is what is hosting the virtual machine, right? So you've all set up your system so that on Windows OS 10 and Linux, your host is Windows OS 10 or Linux, right? And then you have a guest operating system that can run in user mode in some way, right? So we have the host, which is running on the bare metal, the actual kernel, and then we have the guest, which thinks it's actually running on the bare metal, but is actually running in a faked virtual machine environment, right? Um, one way to think about this is that a virtual machine, if we think, what is the API? What are the programming interfaces that a virtual machine has to access the rest of the system? Normally, it's like, oh, a user-level application can make a system call. So the API includes all of the system calls for Linux, right? 
but that's no longer the case here because a virtual machine doesn't think that it's writing, it's running for Linux, in Linux. It thinks that it's running on the bare metal. So the API of a virtual machine is essentially a copy of the hardware itself. This is why we call it a virtual machine, because we are providing a virtualized version of the machine to execute a guest operating system inside of, right? So if we think of what this looks like, we go from a monolithic system that looks like this up to a virtual machine that effectively looks like this, where we have what's called the hypervisor virtual machine monitor, which is the host operating system that runs multiple virtual machines. Each of those virtual machines can be running a whole monolithic system like Linux inside of it right? When those virtual machines need to somehow trap to the hypervisor, um, we'll see some reasons why this might be, but often it's for things like IO, right? If the virtual machine itself is not allowed to talk to a networking card, then it has to have some way to trap down to the hypervisor, the host operating system, to ask it to talk to the networking card for it. These are called hypercalls. Now, we'll talk about the mechanics of hypercalls later, but Really, hypercalls are just like the virtual machine equivalent of a system call, right? Now, in your installation, what it looks like is actually the hypervisor virtual machine monitor, which is your host operating system, OS X, Windows, or Linux. And it can, of course, run a whole bunch of applications and separate virtual address spaces, as you always do. Um, but it can also now run virtual machines. Multipass or um, WSL is able to now run virtual machines alongside your normal processes, which is pretty cool. But it raises a question, like how is this possible, right? What does this mean? How do we provide this virtual machine abstraction or the lie of the virtual machine, right? Um, and the big questions that we're going to kind of think about is effectively not necessarily hypercalls, because hypercalls we kind of already have an idea for. Hypercalls could kind of look like system calls, right, in the worst case. So the real question is how in a guest operating system a system call works. How do we trap, how do we make a system call from a virtual address in one of those guest virtual machines and have it somehow how go to the system call handler executing in the mode zero of the virtual machine to execute the kernel, right? This is all weird now because we aren't running in, use, in kernel mode, we're running in user mode. So how could we like have this weird system call that when we're running in user mode traps from something running in user mode to something running in kernel mode in the guest OS, but it's really running in mode zero, you, I mean, sorry, mode uh, user mode from the perspective of the host operating system, right? The second big question is how, the, how do we make interrupts work in this type of environment, right? Interrupts naturally go to the hypervisor, right? The host operating system. So how do we make an interrupt go to a virtual machine? So these are the two big structural questions that I want you to ponder for just a little bit. Okay. Um, <clears throat> how do we make a system call work? So the gray box is the virtual machine. And what we do is we make it so that the processes running within the virtual machine are actually effectively running as processes within our host operating system, right? But when one of those processes makes a system call, what we want to do is not have it be answered by our host operating system, the hypervisor. Instead, we want it to be answered by the actual virtual machine kernel, which is in the guest operating system. So when we receive a system call from that process, we need to somehow switch over to usually the separate virtual address space that contains the virtual machine kernel for the guest operating system. And then somehow that operating system in the host needs to upcall into that kernel. What that means is effectively set the instruction pointer and stack pointer to what the virtual machine kernel expects for a system call. We've said many times that during a system call, 
um, the instruction pointer and stack pointer are set to values that were chosen by the kernel and you start executing the system call handler layer. Well, now the virtual machine kernel in the guest operating system has set up its fake virtual hardware, including its instruction pointer and stack pointer that we should use when, the pro when its processes make a system call. So now that host operating system, the hypervisor, simply needs to, when it executes the uh, VM kernel's virtual address space. It just needs to set the instruction pointer and stack pointer to those locations. And all of a sudden, we actually think within the virtual machine kernel that we're executing a system call, right? So what's happening here is the host operating system, the hypervisor, is faking that a system call is happening by making two separate virtual address spaces coordinate one that thinks it's executing user level code and one that thinks it's executing kernel level code. Now the additional complication here is that the virtual machine's kernel it's running in user mode, right? So it cannot make sensitive or privileged instructions like halting the machine, like in and out, like we talked about. So what happens is that when it makes any of those instructions, that actually causes a fault, an exception, uh, much like divide by zero, that gets um, uh, sent to the hypervisor to the host operating system. At that point, the host operating system can pretend, it can virtualize the hardware um, that that guest operating system did execute that type of a system call. This is called emulating sensitive instructions. So the trivial one would be if the virtual machine calls halt, well, it's not allowed to call halt because only kernel level can do that. So that would cause an exception that starts executing in the invalid instruction handler within the hypervisor. And the hypervisor at that point can say, oh, I know that I'm executing a virtual machine and I know that you're trying to execute the halt instruction. What I'll do is just deallocate all of the virtual machine, get rid of the VM and all of its processes. And hey, you've halted the machine, right? Um, this is all, so this is all complicated, right? And it starts to look a little bit like a microkernel, right? Because we're, like, if you look at these arrows, it almost looks like IPC between the user level processes and the guest operating system, right? So that, especially in hypervisors, is very expensive. Microkernels are optimized around it. Um, within hypervisors, this is very hard because it needs to make that look like it is the hardware, right? So, <coughs> luckily, um, I think around 2007 or so, um, AMD came out with virtualization extensions for x86, and then the Intel basically copied them, creating a very weird licensing agreement where AMD needs to pay licensing fees to Intel every time it sells a chip because it's licensing the x86 ISA, but then Intel, whenever it sells a chip, needs to pay AMD money because of the um, x86-64 extensions here. Um, but it's very interesting, these licensing agreements. So anyway, Intel came out with its um, hypervisor extensions as well. And what they do is they provide hardware logic to not just having dual mode hardware, but now having, of course, mode 0 and mode 1 that are indicated uh, accordingly in the picture, but also a virtual mode 0 and a virtual mode one. So you're executing in the real machine's mode one, user mode, but within that user mode, the hardware provides a virtual machine abstraction of being able to execute in virtual mode one or virtual mode zero, right? And it also supports system calls within that context. So when the CPU is running at virtual mode one, and of course the, the real host operating systems mode one in user mode, a system call will not trap to mode zero in the host operating system. Instead, the hardware virtualization support provided by AMD and Intel will say, oh, I'm actually executing within a virtual machine in virtual mode one. What I need to do is do all of the normal operations that would be done when trapping to a system call, but instead do it within this virtual mode zero. Right, so now system calls go directly from virtual mode zero, uh, from virtual mode one, user mode, to kernel mode. Right. However, all of that code is still executing really in user mode from the perspective of the guest operator or of the 
perspective of the host operating system. Um, hopefully that gives you some indication of how this works. Um, there are ways for the, um, the kernel within the guest operating system to make explicit hypercalls, and there are exceptions that it can trigger. If it executes a sensitive instruction that for some reason the hardware virtualization support can't handle, that will still make an exception down to the hypervisor that will have to figure out what to do with it. This is effectively where Chemu comes in. So we're using Chemu to run XV6, and Chemu is effectively the thing that handles all of those um, exceptions effectively from the virtual machines. <clears throat> okay, so now what happens with interrupts? Let's back up. No hardware virtualization support exists. They haven't extended the hardware ISA with that type of support. Um, so we have to implement it on our own. How does an interrupt happen? Well, an interrupt from a real device, of course, goes to the host operating system, the hypervisor or the virtual machine monitor, right? Linux, OS X, or Windows on your machine right? Um, so now the operating system might say, okay, I received data from the network that I know should go up to the virtual machine. It knows that the virtual machine is running its kernel within a certain virtual address space. And at that point, it needs to stop the execution within that virtual address space for um, the kernel and interrupt it. So it needs to change the memory within that kernel process to effectively manually save the instruction pointer and stack pointer and then push onto this kernel stack um, whatever is necessary to actually make the interrupt kind of happen. It needs to emulate what the hardware would do within the guest operating system. And then it needs to set the instruction pointer effectively, instruction pointer and stack pointer, to the instructions that the virtual machine's kernel said that it wanted to accept that um, interrupt at. So effectively, start executing the ISR, right? The interrupt service routine. So here again, the hypervisor has a real hard job. It's kind of reaching into the process. It's changing the kernel stack. It's emulating what the hardware would be doing for an interrupt. This is all very hard and kind of in, in total, just very slow. So um, we have additions to the um, hardware virtualization support that help us do the same thing. Effectively, you can ask the hardware to insert an interrupt for you, and the hardware will essentially do it, um, no problem, no questions asked. Um, it'll uh, simply do all those modifications to save registers, restore registers, set up the kernel stack, and start executing the ISR. It'll emulate all that for you. So again, the host operating system now has a much easier job. So now I want you to ask the question, now that you kind of understand how virtual machines work a little bit, um, what are their benefits and trade-offs? Um, Penny knows this answer. She doesn't need to uh, even think about it, but I would expect most of you would. Um, pause it, and we'll come back. All right. Um, virtual machines have a ton of benefits. They're a wonderful abstraction that's actually been around for a very, very long time. Um, IBM came up with it initially because mainframes essentially needed to support backwards compatibility. You wanted to be able to run old versions of the system alongside new ones. And to do that, they had to come up with a way to emulate or virtualize the old systems. <clears throat> um, so this really points out the benefit of virtualization, that it can support legacy like the best of them right? Because the API that it provides is the hardware. Any software, any operating system that was previously able to run on that hardware should be able to run in your virtual machine. So we have a situation where effectively you can support any legacy software that you want, right? Legacy just means kind of an old software that might not work on your current popular APIs. Right? So virtual machines fundamentally are the best solution to running legacy software. Um, fundamentally though, I mean, we, we really just have multiple operating systems that are able to share the hardware. Certainly the host operating system has the most privilege, is in charge of the real hardwares, uh, managing the real hardware, but we also have now guest operating systems that can run alongside it. 
And one of the big benefits of this is effectively that those virtual machines are protected from each other, right? Um, it's very hard if the only abstraction that you have to reach out and touch the rest of the system looks like the hardware itself. It's very hard to maliciously try to mess up another process that's running outside of your virtual machine or mess up another virtual machine running alongside yours, right? Um, virtual machines support a relatively strong um, form of isolation, but they also do allow some coordination. Maybe two virtual machines can have files mapped into both of them so they can share files. They can communicate with each other over a network, a kind of a virtual network provided by the virtual machine monitor, the hypervisor, right? Um, but fundamentally, if you don't coordinate between them, they're pretty strongly isolated. One of the main current uses of virtual machines is the consolidation of many low re resource usage systems into fewer busier systems. So when the cloud came to be, it was motivated effectively by consolidation. Everybody had 10 servers in the closet of their company, of their business. They had an IT staff to service those, and those 10 service servers ran the web server, the mail server, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But all of them were pretty lightly used because, you know, I mean, why, why would any of them be heavily used? If they're heavily used, you'd have multiple of them serving those things, right? So consolidation effectively means, oh, now you can run each of those workloads in a virtual machine. And by the way, we'll run it for you in the cloud. So you no longer need that closet full of servers and the IT staff to support them, right? Um, fundamentally, also, and important in that, is that they do provide high security, good security, as I mentioned, and this is typically used in multi-tenant environment. Um, this is the idea that you have multiple people renting hardware, therefore the tenant terminology, and tenants don't trust each other. So this is the cloud, right? Multiple people can, well, thousands, millions of people can run their code on the cloud. None of them trust each other, but they're isolated from each other, generally using virtual machines. So if you need to support legacy, virtual machines are great. If you want to support legacy and um, uh, very little trust between tenants, then virtual machines are fantastic. So as you can see, Penny's already a little worried about this slide. Um, I want you to think a little bit about virtual machines and microkernels. Are either of them a generalization of the other? Which is to say, can you essentially implement one of them with the other, right? Um, why are microkernels better? Why are virtual machines better? Um, and then which are more commonly used? And then where and why, right? Take a little bit to think about it. Penny needs to get, you know, her head about her anyway. She's a mess. All right, pause it, come back. Um, okay, so is either a generalization of each other? This is a weird question, um, but Microkernels have been shown to be able to implement um, most of virtual machines before there was hardware virtualization in a pretty efficient way, um, in a more efficient way than you could implement virtual machines on monolithic systems, right? So there are certainly arguments to be made that microkernels, because they focus on IPC, because they focus on communicating between different isolated things, could support the communication that was necessary for things like system calls efficiently. So if a system call was communication between two processes, one of them running an application in the VM and the other one running the kernel of the VM, then microkernels tended to be much faster than the alternative. However, when we get to hardware virtualization, um, it gets a little stranger. You don't want to implement virtual machines in microkernels in that way anymore. However, many microkernels have virtualization extensions built into them, which is to say that uh, microkernels can use the hardware ISA extensions to be able to run virtual machines themselves. What that effectively means is that one of those processes for microkernels ends up looking, ends up being a whole virtual machine, and it can use IPC to ask for services to trap when um, it needs to execute instructions that it cannot um, to other services using IPC, right? Um, Virtual machines, if you look at them 
you know, kind of squint your eyes a little bit. They look a little bit my, like microkernels because they're kind of communicating between user level and kernel level and um, between kind of isolated things. But when hardware virtualization came to be, you know, virtual machines started to look very different than microkernels, right? So virtual machines really, you could run a microkernel inside of a VM, but that's not really the same thing, right? Is can you implement one with the other? Um, microkernels commonly implement virtual machines. Um, so it's kind of a question of what you want. Do you want to be able to run virtual machines and still run a whole bunch of services alongside them in a microkernel for heightened isolation? Um, or do you just want to run a virtual machine monitor that's customized for running VMs? Which is more commonly used? I'd imagine most of you would think VMs are more commonly used because they're kind of the core of EC2, um, of the cloud as we know it, and you're all using them. Um, and there's certainly some truth to that. But microkernels are actually pretty common as well. I think pretty much every single one of you that has an iPhone is running a microkernel in the secure processor of the iPhone. Um, some Android systems have microkernels in them as well. Google's new operating system that is going to replace Chrome OS and Android is a microkernel. Um, so they're actually relatively common. Like I said, they're used in um, embedded systems quite a bit, systems that control the physical world. So they are not, um, they are used in a whole bunch of places where you wouldn't know that they're used, typically because we want to kind of hide the parts of our system that need to be secure, need to be reliable. So generally you use virtual machines when you need a multi-tenant environment and you want legacy support. You want to be able to run legacy code. Microkernels are tend to be used in places where security and reliability are your first constraint, the thing that you care most about. Okay, the last system structure that we're going to talk about is containers. Um, I, these are a term that have been flying around for a while. They're very popular. They're a really cool technique. Um, I want you to ask yourself, what are they? Um, and what is their structure? If you've heard of them, try to kind of uh, get an intuition. If you haven't, that's fine. Um, I'll answer in a second. So pause and I'll return. Penny is very concerned about this question. Okay. Um, so containers... Uh, are the thing on the right. So the thing on the left is effectively just a normal monolithic system, okay? And the idea is that in a monolithic system like Linux, for instance, every process has a, a process identifier, a PID, a name associated with it, a number associated with it. In this case, Word has 10, Browser has 11. And they all kind of can access files on your file system um, in roughly the same way, right? You have a root, you can go into home, you can go into gparmer, or you could go into the user shady mcshady, see what they're all about, probably nothing good, probably only nefarious things. And this is how we think about normal systems. Word and browser, they kind of go through your file system just the same. They may have different permissions to different parts of your file system, but they can usually go through a lot of it and they see the same namespace for the file system. Um, on the right, we see containers. So the dotted lines indicate kind of the container logic. A container is still using a monolithic operating system. It just runs on top of Linux, Windows, whatever, right? Um, however, within each of the containers, the monolithic operating system API has been extended to allow separation of namespaces between different containers. What that effectively means is that you can have process ID 10 and 11 in one of the containers, as we see on the left, and then process 10 and 11 in the other container on the right. You can have overlap between those two process identifier namespaces simply because containers have separate namespaces. That means uh, that effectively containers don't necessarily see what each other are doing very well, right? Um, with the file system, you can see that when a browser tries to open a path on the file system, a container allows you to say where the root of that container is. In this case, the container on the left has its root set to my home directory. So my home directory would be seen as the root 
directory of that container. Whereas Shady McShady over there is constrained with root being their own home directory. So what that means is that the namespaces are somewhat disjoint here. The, the files that the second container will be able to see do not include any of my own files, right? So the fundamental technique behind containers is effectively namespace isolation and separation. However, the structure of the system actually hasn't changed at all. Um, system calls still go directly from a process down to the kernel. Um, if there is a bug in the kernel, keeping in mind that the kernel is 50 million lines of code, right? Um, or if some malicious hacker is able to leverage some bug within the kernel, they will take over the entire system, including every container on the system. This is very different from virtual machines, where if you compromise the kernel in your virtual machine, you only have access to the resources of that virtual machine. Right? So this is a big difference between containers and virtual machines. It means that containers provide significantly less isolation than virtual machines. Um, but they are amazingly nice for development and operations. I can almost guarantee that you will use containers professionally and probably relatively frequently when you're going to an internship or when you go to off to a job. The reason that they're so useful is because a container is not just an application. It is an application in all of the libraries and other applications that it requires to execute. So if you remember when you installed the VM infrastructure and your editor and everything for this class, yeah, it was kind of a pain because you had to go through and manually install all of those things, right? But a container includes all of that stuff on its own. So what you could do is instead just run the operating, uh, the GW operating system container, and it would automatically have all of that stuff set up for you. This means that Different developers working on the same project can essentially have an identical environment without really need to, needing to work at it, right? A container is that abstraction of an identical environment. When you need to deploy your code, that's fine. You deploy a container to ops, right? So containers are brilliant for development and really changed how people think about development on systems. <clears throat> Um, so, first and foremost, they provide a reproducible development and production environment. This is, um, by my estimation, the biggest benefit, right? This simply comes from the fact that you don't install an application like we typically think about. You just can install a container, which means an application and all of its dependencies, right? You don't need to worry about library versions and all of that stuff, right? So now a kernel bug load does lead to a system full system compromise. So these are not as secure as virtual machines, as microkernels. Um, instead, they kind of provide the same security as a monolithic system from the perspective of bugs in the kernel have an equal impact in both systems. Um, I forgot to write a summary. Um, so the summary here is that we've gone through no structure, monolithic structure, microkernel, virtual machines, and containers. These are different ways of thinking about how the different pieces of software on your code should be isolated from each other and how they should communicate. And we've seen that different decisions in system structure can lead to trade-offs between how fast a system is, whether you need microkernel-based IPC that's slower than a raw system call, therefore or slower than a monolithic system, um, or you want security. Ah, microkernel um, isolates all these pieces of code from each other and minimizes the code in the kernel, therefore minimizing the impact, minimizing the um, uh, probability will be compromised, right? So now you have so much isolation in the system, you have more security. Um, virtual machines, great for legacy environments and um, great for multi-tenant environments. Containers, great for development and production, effectively. So um, that is system structure. Hope you enjoyed. Bye-bye.